to finish our Friday clinics, we have the Diamond Kinetics Motion Technology Session called How Technology Unlocked My True Potential at the Plate and Made a 2016 MLB Home Run Champion. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Buddy Clark, founder of Diamond Kinetics, and Dan Kusad. Thank you. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and talk uh, late this afternoon and appreciate those of you who are going to stick around and, and listen. Um, we're going to talk about technology and how technology can be used to, as we say in the slide, unlock a hitter's true potential. So as uh, was mentioned, I'm Buddy Clark. I am the founder of Diamond Kinetics and also a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm lucky enough to be here today with uh, Dan Cusid, who is a uh, hitting instructor from Pro Swing RX right here in Anaheim. And uh, interesting thing about Dan is he's had the unique opportunity to work with some really special athletes, um, uh, special hitters, as we'll see in the slides here later on. So for most of you, like me, we've coached for years. And the sensor of choice, well, it wasn't really choice. It's the only one we've got, uh, is our eyes. And that's what we've used for our, pretty much our whole coaching careers to uh, identify players' uh, performance, their ability, identify their weaknesses. Uh, then we do an assessment, right? We decide what, what's that player doing wrong, what does he need to change, and we provide feedback. And that's the loop that we go through. Even if we use video technology, we're ultimately using our eyes. But we're at the stage now, we're at the beginning of an era where uh, we have sensors that have never existed before. We have tool uh, information that we'd never had access to before. Um, we can sense the bat motion, we can sense the ball motion, incoming, outgoing, uh, and many other things besides that. So the key question is, how do we use that technology, how do we use that information effectively to get the hitter to do what we want the hitter to do? So that's what we're going to focus on today. We're really going to focus on two pieces of technology. Uh, as you can see here, we're talking about hit tracks, which uh, many of you may have seen hit tracks over in the booth. Uh, hit tracks measures exit conditions of the ball and then predicts where the ball will go in flight uh, after it's been measured. So it measures primarily the vertical and horizontal launch angles uh, and the speed of exit. And once we know that, we can predict the ball flight. Uh, we also are going to talk about Diamond Kinetic's swing tracker sensor. Uh, and that, you can see an example here, we got one in, in a bat, uh, that measures the bat motion. So everything about the swing of the bat, um, velocities, accelerations, angular rates, uh, and we can convert that into useful metrics. Uh, so we now we know the before information, the cause of the ball flight, and we know the ball flight itself. So what Dan's been able to do work, in working with his players is really effectively use this information to take them to another level. All right, so uh, he's going to start with some case studies on that. Well, thank you very much for having me out here, buddy. Appreciate it. And thanks for you guys for being here to listen to the information as far as what we're going to talk about and how we apply this stuff. We've all seen the technology. We've all seen this stuff. We've all got players who have sensors on their bats and, and don't, you know, how do we use this information? What does it exactly mean? We're not going to be talking about I want to get into swing techniques, about mechanics, about technique, this and that, and you know, you have to do this or you have to do that, because that's not what this is all about. It's all about just taking the numbers that we see, being provided by hit tracks, being provided by diamond kinetics, and how this information applies to each hitter individually. The numbers don't lie. They don't. We'll start off with our first player right here who happens to be Connor. You can see Connor's swing, and the swing really isn't relevant as far as what we're, what we're talking about, but what he was trying to do is what he was being told to do. And this is exactly what he was accomplishing. That swing right there, the numbers on the right side of it show that his uh, average launch angle is negative 4.3. Average first contact to ground, 53 feet. 
I'll explain the, <clears throat> the graph right here real quick. The left side is your exit speed going up from 20 to 100 miles an hour, the bottom line being the launch angle. The majority of the balls that Connor was uh, hitting at this time were in the f uh, negative 4.3 range. So right here, hitting right in front of the pitcher's mound. So unless you're running a 4-2, <laughs> unless you're running under a 3-9 from the left side, I, I don't know how, you know, how well that's going to work. It's not going to translate to the next level or any level beyond. So we go to Connor and say, okay, Connor, you know, we need to make some adjustments to you. Uh, you're a big, strong, athletic kid. You probably need, to be, probably need to be working on a little bit higher launch angle. But also when you're working at launch angles, you have to understand that when you start increasing launch angles, you absolutely need to increase exit velocity or make sure you're, you're gaining exit velocity. Weak fly balls, flares aren't what we're talking about. Lifting the ball isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about driving, projecting balls. We're talking about making players, having them realize what kind of damage they can do. How dangerous can they be? Then these numbers tell us this stuff. So we go to the next slide, buddy. This is Connor now. Connor's taken his launch angle. He's raised his average launch angle up to approximately 25 degrees. You can see that his exit velo along with launch angle has gone up close to 100, and he's carrying that, those numbers 97 miles an hour from basically 10 degrees out to 35 degrees. That's pretty exceptional. Which player would we all rather have? The last Connor, right? That's the guy that's going to do damage. That's the guy that's going to be dangerous. That was only a few months ago, gentlemen. And it's not because I have some magic potion. We all have it. It's not because I have something that we can, I can sprinkle on a player or, you know, I have the, the secret sauce. It's letting the players be the players. If we, and these, the numbers that we're gathering with the, with the sensors, with this information, it doesn't lie. It tells us. It tells us what the player is capable, actually capable of doing. It's pretty cool. It's pretty exciting. Because now this kid has interest from three major league clubs. You wouldn't have thought that in the previous uh, swing, would you? So going, how do we take that and apply it to all of our players is really what this comes down to. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of before and after with Connor. You can see that uh, consistently he's over 350 feet with a max of 402. And we've mostly eliminated balls that were easily fielded in the infield. If you're going to hit the ball wherever it is, Hit it hard. Hit it hard. If it's on the ground, hit it hard. If it's a line drive, hit it hard. If it's a fly ball, hit it hard. Hard fly balls. Hit the ball hard. Quality, consistent contact. That's what the information is given to us with the diamond kinetic sensors and with the information from hit tracks. That's how you get it all. So what's happened here? We communicated the objective, hey, let's get a little bit more launch angle. We have told him we want that also at exit velo, increase the exit velo. The results have been measured with the sensors. Um, given the player continuous feedback, so he is able to then process and work towards the objective. Then with the guidance, whatever guidance you have, whatever techniques you want to use, whatever thought process, swing process you have, the player's handcuffs can then be taken off. And now you have a player that is dangerous, can do damage for you, a lot of damage, and win you more games, score you more runs. It's all about you putting up more runs across the plate than the other team. That's the bottom line. Winning games, developing players. So with that said, I'll let Buddy go into a little more detail. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening behind all of this, um, or specifically um, the, the theme throughout here is going to be that um, this Connor had a certain set of launch angles at certain velocities, and he shifted those up and to the right, uh, higher, higher velocities, higher launch angles. Why is that important? Uh, some of it's pretty obvious. Uh, as Dan said, hit the ball harder, good things happen. So increasing 
ball exit speed makes perfect sense, right? But what's going on with the launch angle? So uh, Alan Nathan, who we work pretty closely with, he's one of our advisors, and, and most of us know him pretty well for all of the work he's done in, in baseball physics. Uh, he did a series of papers uh, in the past year or so uh, analyzing data that's available in the major leagues from StatCast uh, to look at uh, outcomes and the probability of certain uh, base hits, home runs, certain uh, events, depending on how you hit the ball. So here's an example that shows uh, balls hit. Uh, this is home run probability for major league players. Balls hit between 20 and up to 40, 45, mile, uh, 45 degrees of launch angle at a high enough velocity are guaranteed to be a home run. Um, that's just the physics of the problem. So the red area in this plot between those two sets of launch angles and high velocities upwards of 100 miles an hour uh, will result in a home run. So for power hitters especially, that's where they want to hit the ball. Uh, it actually works well for non-power hitters. These balls in the gap, um, extra base hits, uh, also want to have these launch angles. So let's look at launch angles a little bit more carefully. So what I'm showing here is a curve of the distance the ball will travel for a whole range of launch angles, all the way from negative angles where the ball goes down uh, to very positive angles where it's going up. So each data point is at 80 miles an hour. We just pick the number. Um, and the curve will vary a little bit depending on the aerodynamics. And I'm not going to get into uh, ball spin and, and the um, conditions of the atmosphere and all that. But roughly, this is, this is how it works. And if you increase the angle at which the ball is launched into the air, uh, the distance increases up to a point, and that's about 40, 45 degrees. And then, of course, if you go above that, you get a pop-up, and the, and the distance comes back down. Uh, and that maximum occurs at just about any speed of launch angle. So if we take a particular case, uh, to explain this a little more clearly, uh, let's just say I hit the ball at, at zero degrees. A lot of people would say, that's a great, great hit. That's a goal. Hit it straight off the bat, right back uh, zero degrees, level to the ground. Right? Um, the ball's going to travel. Uh, the bottom plot here shows the actual flight of the ball. So all these dashed lines are going to be ball flight. Um, doesn't get off the ground very much. It only started two feet off the ground in this example. And it only travels about 30 feet before it hits the ground. That's a ground ball. So let's elevate the ball a little bit. Now we're going to hit it at 10 degrees. Uh, and a lot of us in the cage would think that's, that's pretty good elevation. Um, that seems to be a pretty good goal. Well, in this plot, 10 degrees does get the ball farther out, but put it in perspective, it goes about 130 feet or so. There's where second base is on the infield. So this, this ball hit the ground roughly right back of second base, about where the shortstop and second baseman play on an arc, right? So another ground ball, another fairly easily fielded ball. If we go all, all the way up to 30 degrees, now we can have the possibility of an extra base hit. Ball's over the infield. In this case, mostly uh, short of the outfielders. Uh, this ball is, can be an effective hit. And it's actually not hit that hard. And then if we go all the way to the other side, at 60 degrees, uh, we're beyond the maximum. Uh, that's a pop-up. Obviously, that's really not what we want. But I'm just showing the full series of, of angles here. That's launch angle. But as Dan said, we really need two components to be effective. Uh, we can't just have speed. We've got to have speed at the right angle. And we can't just have angle. We have to have angle at the right speed, right? So let's look at speed for a second. Speed, again, is pretty self-explanatory. As speed increases on, on the ball, it goes farther, right? No big surprise there. And it's a, it's a linear relationship. So if we look at a, a case, now we're kind of uh, flipping it around here. We're picking a specific launch angle. All these are 10 degrees. We'll start at 60 miles an hour. That's what the trajectory looks like. Um, never gets, uh, doesn't get out of the infield, never gets very high. Hit it a little faster. We'll hit it at 80 miles an hour at the same angle. This is the ball we saw a while ago that landed just back at second base. So not very effective hit. Even if we go all the way to 100 miles an hour at 10 degree launch angle still. The ball gets out in the, into the outfield. No one's going to argue that's most likely a base hit all day long, right? But we've kind of wasted that 100 mile an hour 
exit speed. Uh, that ball was crushed, right? Um, that's, that's probably a single. You hit it to an outfielder. It's one hopper to the left fielder. Uh, he wasted 100 miles an hour and got a single out of it. Now, base hit's a base hit, but we could have done more with it. So anyway, this is 10, 10 degree damage. launch angle. Damage, he did damage. Is a single damage? Damage. Uh, most people we would, would want a little damage. more damage than that, probably. Let's look at a few more case studies. You, a lot of you may be sitting out there saying, well, you can't be done with all the players. With, uh, you're talking about major league players. You're talking about elite collegiate players. It doesn't matter what level the player is. The potential of that player can be locked, unlocked at, at any level. This is a 12-year-old, 11-under uh, player. Uh, Team USA uh, player that came in, and again, we're not looking at, let's not talk swing mechanics and all this stuff. We can get, have discussions for days on this. Uh, look at his launch angle. His exit velocities are roughly around 65 miles an hour. The majority of his hits, again, were below zero in this case. Uh, he was carrying uh, 55 miles an hour out to 40 degrees. So again, talk to him, hey, we see more there, we can get more out of you. Um, yes, we have to stop being a flamingo. Um, that was funny, guys. See how he's swinging with his back foot off the ground? Yeah, yes, I like that. And we look where he is, you know, just a few months later. Uh, Nick has made some improvements, drastic improvements. He's actually staying pretty close to the ground, not all the way on the ground. But his exit velocities and launch angles have increased. You can see where his launch angles have increased out to 40 degrees and maintaining actually a higher exit velocity, almost 80 miles an hour, 75 out to 40 degrees. It's very easy to teach this stuff. When you have the right information to unlock the handcuffs that these kids, a lot of these players come to me with uh, for whatever reason and get them to realize what their full potential is to do damage, to be dangerous hitters for you for themselves to develop, and who knows where they can go from there. So let's go on to the next one. This is Alex. Alex is a high school senior this year. This is him a couple months ago. This is when we were trying out a new black and white camera, looking to see if the contrast was uh, give us better feedback. And Alex is 140 pounds, six foot, pretty skinny kid. Wanted to came to me and said, hey, coach, I want to hit the ball over... Yes, I use coach. Usually I usually use Dan, but he said, hey, coach, I want to hit the ball over 250 feet. Um, I said, okay, Alex, let's see what we can do. So we, again, took the handcuffs off a little bit. You can see he's 80 miles an hour, and he's out at 20 degrees max, and he's holding about 75 out at 20 degrees. It's not going to go 250 feet. Moving forward to present day, this is Alex now. Again, he's still 140 pounds, maybe 142. So we're gaining a little bit of weight, and we've gained, you can see how he's gained a lot of exit velocity as well as a lot of an increase in launch angle. So he's hitting the ball right now. He's averaging approximately 20 degrees on launch angle. Most of his hits, we don't, you can't see that here. I apologize. But he's primarily in the 20 to 30 degree range. And he's holding 94 miles an hour out there. He's hitting the ball about 360 feet. His, I mean, that's, for a guy that weighs 142 pounds, that's pretty darn good. Ain't nothing special. Not, not a, you know, I'm not talking about a guy that has exceptional talent. It's just taking the handcuffs off, unlocking it. That's what these, the information that we gather from the sensors from, uh, from hit tracks, from diamond kinetics, allow us to do. Allow the players to realize what their full potential is so they can do damage for you. This is Kyle. This is a minor league player uh, as of right now. This is Kyle last year prior to spring training. Going, uh, looking at it, Kyle, uh, you know, Kyle's an accomplished player. The problem with his organization that... Uh, that they had with him is the fact that he never hit for power. Phenomenal receiver, plus arm, didn't hit for power. What do we do with this kid? We want him to move up. All right, Kyle, here's where you're at. You know, you're 90 miles an hour across the board, out to 20, 
out to about 18 degrees and you fall off and you're hitting balls that are just being caught, lazy fly balls. Not going to work. Doesn't, doesn't translate to the major league level. Not, this is, again, player specific. So Kyle moving forward. Now Kyle is carrying 100 miles an hour out to uh, 20 degrees. And he's actually carrying at 25 degrees at about 97 miles an hour and out to 30 degrees, 92 miles an hour. I'll let you know that Kyle was moved up to, in his organization, to the 40-man roster, spring training invite, and will be on the major. He will be uh, the backup catcher for his team this year. Phenomenal accomplishment. Here's Kyle right here. Again, not talking about swing mechanics, just looking at the fact that he was able, again, to unlock himself and move up, become dangerous, be able to do damage. Not too bad. Buddy? All right, so let's um, look, at, uh, look at this a little bit differently here. We uh, have been focused on launch angle and exit speed needed, um, but... Uh, this chart actually shows what's needed to, to create some, some results. So we're calling this a, a damage region. So this could be a home run distance. It could be um, uh, just some distance on the field to get it over the outfielders. Um, pick a, a number that you call damage. Um, there's a combination of exit speed and launch angle required to get it up into that green area where we'll say that's, that's our goal. Um, and you'll notice that as you move away from the center of that curve, the exit speeds go up drastically. So if you're hitting at low launch angles, and we'll just pick an example, um, uh, and I guess I should point out a lot of players live outside of that curve, by the way, and that's what we want to do to make them better. Um, if we pick a, a dot outside of that curve, uh, this ball's hit at 120 miles an hour, but only uh, 10 degrees, and you can see what its trajectory looks like. Uh, that's one of those wasted uh, hits, if you will. Probably is a base hit, but it's not really doing significant damage offensively. Um, aren't a lot of balls hit at 120 miles an hour. I don't know how many you see on, on hit tracks at your place, but... Well, you, uh, have, you, have if, you have 160 miles an hour on here. What's that? You have 160 miles an hour on here. Yeah, we're plotting it all the way out, right? If you go lower on, on launch angle... Because I want that player. <laughs> I want that player, too. So do they. But hit it at negative 5 degrees, it's not going to help you a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> if you shift over at a higher launch angle... Uh, and drop the speed by 20 miles an hour in this case, that ball's a home run. That ball goes over 400 feet. So um, just by using the right part of the range, the player doesn't have to max out, doesn't have to swing out of his shoes every time, and can still have a pretty good result. That's kind of the moral of the story with this curve. So what do I do with the rest of my, my team? Well, this is some more work by Alan Nathan that shows not just home runs, but probability of base hits in general. Um, and the red, again, shows highest probability, so red's 100%. If you focus on the red area in this graph, it falls between 10 degrees and 30 degrees. So even if you're not a guy that can hit the ball at 90-plus miles an hour, these balls are still effective. They're still base hits. So it tells us that regardless of the player, the objective should be to put the ball in the air in, in these angles. All right. So we've looked at the outcome. Hit tracks enables us to see what happens to the ball after it leaves the bat. The player doesn't actually have any control over that, right? The player has control over what happens before contact. So swing tracker gives us insight into that. So what we're going to look at for the next few minutes is what happens during the swing and specifically what do we want to have happen during the swing in order to get these results. It comes down to two things, uh, impact momentum, Basically, swing the bat, the bat fast and use a heavy enough bat to, to do some damage um, and approach angle. Those are the two parameters, and they relate directly to high exit speed and high launch angle. And we're going to dig into that for a second. So this is a, another way of plotting it, but from the bat's perspective. Um, this is the exit speed uh, versus uh, approach angle. And we've picked a particular bat. Now we've got to worry about impact with the bat. So what we did was we simulated a particular pitch. So the pitch is coming in at 80 miles an hour. The bat's moving at 70 miles an hour in every one of these data points. And we said, uh, if um, I'm moving the bat 
the barrel is moving at a different launch angle, how far does the ball go? Well, obviously, if I'm swinging down on the ball and square it up, the ball's going to go down. So that's the left side of the curve. As I increase the launch angle, the ball starts to go up in the air and goes a lot farther to a point, and then I get more pop-ups. So here's a little more detailed look. So again, uh, I've got the bat and the ball. So the bat's moving up um, at contact. The barrel's moving at a 10-degree angle up. That's what we call approach angle. Right before impact, uh, what's the angle it's making in the, in the, in the vertical? Um, at 10 degrees, ball's coming in on its normal angle. If it's a fastball, it's about six, um, six degree angle. Um, in order to get that ball to fly at 30 degrees, which we figured that's, we saw as a good angle, then I've got to actually undercut the ball in order to get that 30, 30 degree launch. Well, when I undercut the ball, I'm leaving a lot of energy in the bat that doesn't get translated to, to the ball. Uh, it's wasted energy. It doesn't transfer in the impact. Um, it's like hitting a car at a glancing blow on the highway as opposed to a head-on collision. The head-on collision is the one that, that hurts the most. So in order to get that high launch angle, what I really need to do is I need to tilt that bat just a little further in its, in its swing. So it's got to be moving at about the same angle that I want the ball to leave at. Not exactly right, but generally speaking, that's a good rule of thumb. So I want the launch, the, the approach angle, the bat movement at impact to match my goal uh, on exit launch angle. And now all of the energy that I can goes from the bat to the ball. The ball goes a whole lot further. Okay. Two things are required, though, right? Not just the angle, but the speed. And just like exit speed is directly related to distance, so is bat speed. So if we plot bat speed, um, versus um, exit speed, it's a linear relationship. The faster you swing the bat, if you square it up, the farther the ball goes, the faster it goes when it leaves the bat. That one, again, is also pretty self-explanatory. But you put the two together, you get another curve like this that says, if you want to do damage, just like with the ball exit conditions, if I want to hit a home run, if I want to hit it over the outfielder's head, I've got to go above this line. That's telling me there's a combination of Barrel movement at impact, approach angle, and speed of the barrel. And if I get those two right, I'm going to fall on the upper side of that line. So if we take Mark's results, sort of uh, reverse them to um, this plot, these are his before and after results, his past and current results. You'll notice his bat speeds aren't, aren't crazy fast. But by using that bat speed in the right direction, the curve gets shifted to the right in that part above the, the line. So he's, he's producing damage by just doing the right thing with the bat. So again, we want to focus on bat speed or impact momentum. That's what we call it. Momentum is velocity, uh, mass moving at a velocity. So heavy bat moving at a certain speed, that's its momentum. So we want to in increase our momentum and we want to do it at the right angle. Those are the two things, or two of the things, we can measure in Swing Tracker uh, using our diamond kinetic sensor. So I don't um, need to be able to measure um, ball conditions to, to know what I'm doing right with the bat. I need the ball conditions to make sure I squared it up and uh, you know, made the best contact. But just by knowing what the bat's doing and trying to figure out where I maximize my speed in the bat, which angles work best for me, I can learn a lot. And so that's the moral of the story from the, from the bat sensor side. So how do we use the sensors to, to achieve these results? There's a lot of feedback that the sensor, that the DK sensor gives to us. We can measure approach angle, which directly relates to launch angle. We can measure the barrel speed, which applies to potential energy delivered. We can measure the hand speed, which gets the barrel moving that direction to apply that energy. And then we can actually give you a max acceleration, which is the amount of energy that we're carrying and actually making contact with the ball. There's, other, there's a lot of other metrics that you can pull off of uh, the, the sensors that might be important to you, that you might find important, that different players might find important. I have a couple guys that focus solely on trigger to impact. That's the quickness and getting the barrel moving from point A to point B. 
I've got guys that focus on their hand cast. We don't want to be going out around our body. We want to stay closer in. That means we can get our hands going faster, so on and so forth. There's a lot of options that we can do. The be- the one of the things that a lot of the guys like to see with this sensor is being able to see the 3D recreation of their swing. Because you can get it from overhead, from the side, all kinds of places, and move it around and see exactly where you're maximizing and how efficient are you transferring that energy to and through the ball. Quality hard contact is what we're all after. Qu- consistent quality hard contact will do the most damage. Whether it's here, whether it's here, whether it's there, consistent quality hard contact. Got to have it. Got to have it, and this measures it. So you may, you know, how do we look at doing this stuff? You don't have, you may not have the hit track sensor. You may not have the ability to have one, so on and so forth. But you do, every one of you, if you're not, if you're not using technology to get your players better, at least giving them the information, you're putting them behind the curve. You really are. But here's the information that we can look at and really translate and go, okay, I've got my cage at home, back at my school, back at wherever we're, we're working at. And basically going out to from 15 feet out or 14 feet out from the plate, put a line up in the cage, that's, 30, uh, that's approximately 30 degrees. You can go further out to 20 degrees. It's about 30 feet out. And then you can go out there's a the calculation, the formula that Buddy provided for us here, and I know these slides will be available to you guys, where you can plug in the information and focus on the stuff that you want to focus on. Maximize your player's ability to do damage in whatever area it is that you want, you want that done. I mean, the, the team that did the most damage this year in college baseball was who? Coastal Carolina? Phenomenal job at doing damage. Where did they do damage? They did damage up here. They took the Chris Bryant mentality of if I'm going to hit a ball in the air, which I am going to try to hit a ball in the air, it's going to be not just a fly ball, but a darn hard fly ball. It's not the mentality for everybody, guys. It's not. But it's learning how to take the information that we have here and apply it to the players that you have. And I guarantee you, you will see positive results. Try it. The information is being provided to us. These kids want this information. They see it on TV all the time. It's cool to look at exit velos and launch angles and distance traveled and so on and so forth. Here's how you can do it without having all the stuff. Just get a sensor on the end of the bat. So it, whether it's, it doesn't matter. Give them the information. Let, take the handcuffs off and let them see what they can do. And you will reap the rewards as numbers in the W column. So and Coastal Carolina is one of our partners now, which we're really excited about. We want to, oh, that's right. want to dig into their numbers and see how they uh, put the ball in the air. So anyway, uh, that's what we have. Um, we are uh, happy to take some questions. We're finished up a little bit early than what the time slots show. So, uh, but we appreciate you being here. So if you have questions, feel free to come, come to the mics if you want, or we'll be up here. We can talk afterward. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much.